So let's welcome uh, uh, our next speaker, Avran. Hi. So um, this is uh, probably most of you uh, heard about microservices. Who, who is actually doing microservices? All right. Uh, who wants to do microservices but don't yet? Good. So basically, this uh, uh, this talk will kind of will take away the hype about uh, microservices uh, as I'm going to tell the story about uh, Wix and how we evolved from from a monolith application to uh, a microservices world. And it is very practical, step-by-step uh, -step, uh, journey um, where you actually can understand that you don't really need all the, the tools and hype around microservices uh, and how DevOps come into play where you, where you want to pick and choose what to use and more importantly, what, what not to use. So, hi, I'm Aviran. I'm uh, head of uh, Wix Engineering. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Wix.com is doing, uh, we're uh, the biggest uh, uh, do-it-yourself website building platform in the world, uh, where everybody without any technical knowledge can drag and drop uh, a bunch of components on the screen, and you have a running website in a few minutes. A little bit about Wix in numbers. Uh, currently, we have 100, around 120 million users. Those are the website builders that use our platform. Uh, we handle a lot of data uh, since we host everything ourselves. We run in multiple uh, data centers and clouds, both Amazon and Google, uh, and our own data centers. Um, about 2,000 employees work at Wix currently. Uh, about 50% is uh, uh, R&D. Uh, interesting fact, uh, Wix is the number one uh, place that developers want to work at. Uh, we're an Israeli company, so we're number one in Israel. And just a couple of weeks ago, we discovered that we're number five in the world, uh, according to Glassdoor. Uh, but uh, we don't want to speak about this. We came to speak about microservices. So Wix has about 500 microservices currently running on production. And when you hear about microservices, you hear about a lot of uh, buzzwords, like you need backward compatibility and monitoring and throttlers, and it has to do with DevOps and continuous delivery, and a lot, a lot of buzzwords. And we want to, to, to sort them out and see what do we want, what we don't want. And the first question that, that we need to ask ourselves is microservices for us is why do we even want microservices? Okay, what's the reason? Not because everybody's talking about it and say, hey, this is the next big, big thing and everybody's doing microservices. Everybody, the, the companies that are doing microservices are doing it for a reason. Okay, and one of the reasons is to scale your engineering. Another is if, if you want to increase your development velocity, or you have a scaling problem in your current architecture and current system. We will talk about all these three topics and see how microservices fit into each one of these uh, categories. Now, microservices is, the, is the, actually the first post DevOps uh, architecture. Uh, since, like you, see, yeah, like you saw before, okay, we are running 500 microservices. Other companies running, you know, maybe tens or hundreds or thousands of microservices. This cannot happen without DevOps culture. Okay, your operation team cannot handle so many different services that are being deployed and rolled back and, and scaled on their own. Your organization cannot scale. So. Let's take a journey back in time and uh, see how do we get from, from a monolith to a microservices. So let's go back in time about seven years ago uh, when Wix 
was a fairly small startup. And like every small startup, uh, you start with the simplest thing that you can that you can do. Okay, startup has their back to the wall. They don't know if they survive. They're trying to get the market fit, and the easiest thing that you can that you can write is a monolith. And like every startup, we did a monolith, which is a good thing. Okay, a monolith has a lot of advantages, but at some point and hopefully most of you will get to that point, uh, you will face uh, a scaling issue. And this is exactly what uh, we encounter. Okay, The monolith basically handled everything. Dependencies between features, changes in unrelated areas, caused downtimes and bugs in one place, uh, you know, brought down the entire system. We hired more and more and more developers, and how many developers you can put on, on a single project. It becomes a scaling uh, issue, both organization and also system uh, scaling. So once we got to, to the realization that Houston, we have a problem, well, we started to think about, OK, what do we need to do? This was around. 2010, microservices were not invented yet, the word microservices, uh, which I'll tell you a secret, it's kind of a bullshit. There is no such thing as microservices. It's basically services, service-oriented architecture just done right. Okay? It's just a hype microservice. So we decided to break the system apart. But in order to, to, break, to break your monolith, uh, the first thing that you need to do is to understand how. So, what does your system do? Okay, what are your concerns? What are you use? How are your users using your system? Do you have different scaling issues to different parts of your system? So, like I said, Wix is a website building platform. So we analyzed our usage our users' usage and whatever scaling issues that we had. And we identified two major patterns in how uh, our system is being used. Okay, So we had basically two major concerns and SLAs. The first thing is when you come to, to a website building platform, you need to build a website. So most of the users come and they want to edit their site. And there we, we saw that most of our feature requests came from this area. You know, the editing part, you want to add new features, new components, new layouts, new colors, and whatever. Um, our users are willing to tolerate a lower performance, uh, 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 performance re requirements. So, while serving a site, you have to be very, very, very fast. While editing, you can tolerate a, li a little bit more slow performance. Um, also, in terms of availability, the first thing that, that we care about is that the sites that our users are building, these are their business. Okay? An e-commerce site, this is the business of our users. Wix makes money from our users coming to edit the site. But our customers making money from the site that's being live. And this is the most important part for us, our user sites, not our own uh, uh, availability. So we have two different types of, of availability concerns, and also two different types of, of uh, read-write patterns. While you're editing the site, it, it's very write-intensive, but viewing a site, it's mostly read. It's a read-only uh, pattern. So while once we identify those, those two uh, usages and two patterns, we decided this is actually how, we are, how we're going to break our system by the SLA of, of our system. So we took our, our monolithic application, let's call it MonoX, and extracted another monolith from it. So one the, the extracted monolith that we took was, we call it the public, the public service. What it does, all it, it cares about is serving the website. 
Okay, the, the rest of the code was left on what we call the editing service. Okay, so essentially by doing that, we took our monolith into two separated services, which basically now we have two monoliths. We don't have microservices yet. We have two monoliths, but with two different distinct SLAs and concerns. Another thing that we did, once we split it, those two monoliths, we put a guideline to our engineers. We said that we don't want any runtime deployment or data dependencies between those two services. Okay, so we truly have independent systems that can run uh, and scale independently. So what did we achieve by that? Uh, so we have a decoupled architecture. Uh, we have independent deployment. And actually, we, uh, the fact that we have more uh, feature requests on the editing side, the part that was actually more important to us is the public, is the serving side, got less and less feature requests. Okay? So we got two different life cycles of deployment. Many deployments were on the editing side, and the public sites remained very, very stable. And that really helps uh, with the operational side. Okay, we actually separated service level for for those two services for two monoliths basically, so they can scale independently. Serving site need probably more servers, right? It it's uh, it has a lot of page views. Think those 120 million users, those are editing users. But now on the public side, we need to serve all the sites that they created, so it's their visitors. So the 120 are Wix's users, and they build websites, and they have a lot more visitors. So they. They need to scale independently. We can now use different data stores and different data schemas for read and write. They don't have to be the same database. We can make changes in, in how we store data and, and optimize for, for reads and writes. We can have different availabilities for those two different services. Okay, if, if we think that we need two data centers or three data centers uh, for serving the site, we can maybe manage with just two on the editing part. Okay, So it really gave us the, the, the flexibility in, in, in defining those metrics. And also, uh, it gave us a more resilient system. Because instead of a bug bringing down the whole system, now a bug just brings just half of our system. So we can have a degradation of service instead of denial of service. And of course, when you have half, just half the service, you have a faster recovery time when your system goes down. So we have two services, okay? Basically two monoliths. And let's see what do we need to learn? What did we learn by just having two? Okay, not 500, just having two. So the first thing that we had to learn is about service boundary. Okay, what are your service boundaries and how you, do you define it? Uh, I always recommend that the database or, or uh, your whatever data store is a great uh, starting point for a service boundary. No two microservices should share database or on, on the schema level or on the table level. We actually like on the table level. Uh, it's a guideline, not a rule. Uh, we can have different, like I said, different data stores. But if, but you can say, okay, I've run. You edit the site, then how do you serve the site? if you don't share the schema, you don't share the database? Well, it's really simple. You just copy the data. <coughs> you copy the data, it's excellent uh, 
a way of, of separating your concerns and having different scaling, uh, scaling uh, uh, no, pardon. Now the second, the second thing that, uh, that we needed to learn or, or tackle, which we don't have in a monolith, is serialization. Okay? When you run in a monolith, you make a function call between one function to another or a method. But now, now you have two different services and you need to understand, okay, how am I going to transfer data between one service to another service? Do I use a binary format, or do, should I use JSON, or text, or XML? Does it go over HTTP or not? What is the trade-offs between those things that I'm going to choose? Do, do I care most about the uh, readability of the payload, the performance, can I debug it? What kind of tools do I have in order to, to, to debug the messages across the wire because right they're, they're not going in the same process. Another thing that we need to care, take care of now is API versioning. Okay, two services now need to communicate. Now I need to define APIs. How do I expose those APIs via REST, via RPC, via SOAP? That's what we talk. Don't tell anyone I told you. So, our first lesson is what we thought would be the best, is we initially uh, choose a binary format uh, called Hessian, for those of you who know what, it's, it's kind of an old binary format. Uh, we thought, yeah, it's, gonna, it's binary, it's fast, it's cool, but there are no debugging tools. We, when we had problems, we couldn't actually send uh, a request from curl. It was really, really, really tough to, to debug and maintain. Uh, so after a while, we just uh, moved away from that and, and moved to the JSON RPC over, over HTTP, which is really easy. Uh, there are a lot of tools to to write JSON, to parse JSON, to send JSON requests. And it took us about six years, more than six years. Uh, and right now, when we are actually hitting another scaling issue, uh, we're thinking about, we actually do move to, to gRPC, which is standard, which is binary, and, and is it's faster than uh, JSON. But JSON RPC, if, if you don't have a, a huge scale, it's an excellent, it's an excellent choice, okay? You can actually write your, your RPC request in, by hand. API versioning. Like I said, okay, we will now need to call, make API calls between two services. Uh, Another choice that we need to make. Do I need API schemas with versioning? Do I need the version in the URL? Do I need to put the version in, in, in headers? Do I use, if, if, even use REST? So the first lesson that we learned is you ain't going to need it. Yagni, for those of you who don't know, is you, you ain't going to need it. You always keep a backward compatible. You're working, currently you're working within your company. It's much easier to, to keep backward compatibility within your own company or even make a breaking change because you can communicate and, and control your own envi environment. You're working in a closed environment where you can control the deprecation policy uh, and, and you can actually make other teams hey, I'm going to break this API you have, I don't know, a month or two or three, whatever your policy is, to make the changes. Where you do need to think about versioning schemas once you open your APIs to, to third-party developers, to the outside world, once you make that, 
you cannot go back, okay? So, but inside, it's much easier. It's easier to maintain. You just keep backward compatibility. You don't need to think about, about versioning your APIs. Now, not all APIs are synchronous, okay? Do you have some asynchronous calls? Now, remember, we were working on a monolith. Uh, but now we have two services. So we need to put some kind of uh, messaging queues uh, in our system, right? We, maybe Kafka, maybe Rabbit, whatever, ActiveMQ, whatever uh, your favorite uh, queuing system. But wait a minute. What did we do when we had a monolith? Did we have a queuing system? No, we used threads. So why do we need a queuing system now? Just because we, because we have another service? Just one? So we don't really need it. And the reason we don't, we don't need it now, okay? The, the, my point is you don't really need it now because th threads will work. They will work between two services. Once you add another middleware, now you need to take care of that too. You put Kafka in place, you need to know how to work Kafka, and you need to scale Kafka, and you need to know how to debug it. Why do you need all this aggravation? If you didn't use it before for your monolith, you don't need it now. Once you hit a scanning issue, once you actually have problems, only then put a queuing system in place, or whatever middleware that, that you need, okay? Everything that worked in, in, in a monolith should work also in a microservice environment, until it doesn't. It's your job to understand when, when it's, it's going to break, when it doesn't work anymore. But don't put the overhead uh, ahead of time. Okay, you will just need to maintain it. Just waste your time. Same goes to service discovery. Now that we have service-oriented architecture, uh, do we need uh, to put a service discovery in place, right? It's very hyped. We got Zookeeper and Consul and etcd and Eureka and You, you ain't gonna need it, okay? You don't need it. You, you don't need a service discovery for two services, or three, or even a hundred, okay? In Dwix, we don't have service discovery, right, even right now, with 500, okay? Right now, we're thinking, and we're, we're, we're doing it, actually, right now, we're considering adding a service discovery. Configuration in your, in your DNS and a load balancer works perfectly. You, Okay. Again, it's the same reason. You have an operational overhead. When you reach to tens of microservices and you think you have a problem, then start thinking about service discovery. Now, one of the big differences that, that, uh, that we learned from moving into to a distributed architecture is we need to figure out how our system is, is more resilient. Okay? So now we have two, two services. And one service needs to communicate with the other. Okay? So can you tell me what does this arrow mean? One direction. Anyone else? This arrow means the failure point. Okay, this is a network connection. When you call one function in a monolith, when you call one method to another, it will run, it will, it will execute, unless the entire service goes down. In a, in a distributed system, when you make a call between one service to another, I can guarantee in 100% that at some point it will fail. Nobody knows what this point is, but it will fail. Okay? Every network hop that you add, every, every RPC call, every REST call that you make is 
a failure point. It reduces your availability and it increases the chance that something all along the way will fail. And it will. But there are strategies to handle this. But you need to be very careful in how you choose your strategies and how you use them. Okay, you can have a retry policy. If you make a call, you make a retry. That's fine, but you can only retry on idempotent op operations. And you better not make too many retries because you will dust yourselves. Okay, if the service is down, there's no point in making a retry and retry and retry and retry because you will basically bring the whole system down eventually. You can use circuit breakers and throttlers. Uh, again, use them carefully, understand the patterns in your system uh, because you can bring down your system. If you circuit break too much or, 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 or too often, you will bring down your own system. Okay. What we found out is that one retry works like 99% of the time. Just one retry. You don't need more than one. But again, it depends on the system, depends on how, how your uh, use case is. But this also brings us uh, an advantage. Okay? If, if we have two different services, now we can actually be more resilient to failures. Okay, uh, instead of, of, of uh, denial of service, if the service is down, we can actually have a degradation of service. We can eliminate parts of the system that don't work. If we have an issue with the editor, we can have a message, okay, currently you cannot edit your site, but your site is still alive and working. Okay. Um, you can have features uh, like, uh, this is one thing that we developed in, in Hackathon, it's called a killer feature. It's basically a, a feature flag that enables or disables parts of, of our system with a nice match. This currently is not available, once we bring it up, we enable this feature. So it's a much nicer user interface than just an error message when the, uh, when the user tries to do some kind of operations. You can have fallbacks. It's maybe it's not 100% correct, but you can correct it later. And I'll give you an example. When for us, for instance, when you edit uh, a site and you click publish in order to make it available to your to your users. Now, in our case, the site URL is con consists with your username. Okay, the username is your subdomain. And in order to get the username, we go to the user server and we said, okay, the user that is signed in right now, what is their username? We take the username and construct the, the URL. Now, what happens if this user service is down? Then I will <coughs> fail my publish operation. I could, if, if, if correctness is that important, but I can also employ a fallback if correctness is, is, if eventual consistency or eventual cor correctness is something that I can live with. So if we fail to communicate with the user server, we just take the username from, from the session cookie, which is by chance also there. Okay, so this is a fallback of something that we can do in case of a service is not available. Eventually, when the user republish, and hopefully the user server is not down for too much time, it will take the new or updated username in if, if, we have, if the user, for some reason, changes uh, the username. So it's also help you in doing self-healing and aggregation, and basically a more uh, pleasant experience to your users. Testing. Testing is important. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's much more complicated uh, uh, to test uh, a distributed system than, than a monolith. Um, after a lot of trials, uh, this is uh, how 
we are testing our system. So we have the client code, we have the service, we have another service, you have the service the dependencies. So the first level of testing is like everything else, we do a unit test, we actually test the, the service itself. The second level of testing, we do an integration test. Integration test actually test the service and up until the boundary of the next service. But that in also includes the, the serialization, okay, the message. We don't mock <coughs> the call, but we actually run a fake server which we are communicating via RPC. Okay, so we're also testing the serialization of the messages. We mock the response from that fake server. Okay. Uh, the next level of testing that we're doing is what we call the server end-to-end, -end, which we actually launch those servers, but only on the first uh, the first uh, 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 dependency. Okay, uh, if if the next server needs another server, we don't we don't actually uh, launch it. We just launch the the first the first hop. So the databases, the services around it, the, the first communication service around it. And then once we're done with that, of course we have the the automation test that checks the entire system. This is mostly done on production. Uh, when you have a very large scale system, it's very difficult to, to actually have another staging with all the data. Uh, so we, we, run, we run daily automations on, on production just to see that everything works. We do have staging environments, but they are, they are limited to subsets, subsets of, of our system. So now we have a distributed system, we need a distributed logging, right? Because we have two services, so we need a distributed logging, no we don't. Okay, uh, again, if you, if you need a distributed logging, you have another operational overhead, you need to put, I don't know, Kibana and Elastic, and you need to, ba to, to babysit it and take care of that. If you didn't have that when you had a monolith, you certainly don't need that when you just have one other service. Eventually, you will probably want it, okay? Uh, when it becomes too difficult to, to look at logs. Uh, Gabi is laughing, we have 500 microservices and we still don't have distributed logging. You can, we can grab <laughs> around, around logs. Actually, um, we don't really uh, like logs, or don't really believe in logs. Who among you actually know how to write a good log, or saw a good logging file that you actually have all the information that you have without having to redeploy something because you missed some information in the log, or didn't copy, oh, this is the log XML, I will just copy it from the internet, put it in my application, and I have a logging system. Logging is hard. Uh, we actually uh, uh, think that it's much better to just put all the information that you need inside your application. Just having a great monitoring system uh, is much better than logging. Logging is good for forensics. It doesn't really help you when you actually have uh, a crisis, you have downtime uh, in real time. Most of the time. Not all the time, most of the time, by the time you understand the logs and you, you find something, if you have a great monitoring system, you almost don't need to, to look at logs. So this is something that we built in part of our framework. Uh, every microservice that, that is deployed have that dashboard inside it which brought statistics and, 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 and the last error messages and the uptime, whatever the information that we need, that it just comes inside uh, our, our, our uh, microservice framework. And of course we have other uh, monitoring systems like uh, Grafana and Uralic and more. 
many, many more. Now, what about ownership? Okay, um, who owns a microservice? A microservice is not like code. It's owned by a team, not by an individual developer. We all know the piece of code that somebody wrote like uh, five years ago and doesn't work in the company anymore and nobody maintain it. It doesn't work with microservices. If you let one developer develop microservice and that developer leaves your company, you are stuck with a production system, with something live in production that nobody can maintain. If there is an issue, you have a crisis with your customer. Okay, your users are going to be affected by it because nobody can maintain a live system. So, unlike a, unlike a code or a library, microservices always have owners, and the owner is a team. And if you have one person, hopefully you don't, but let's say you do have only one person that wrote a microservice and, and maintain it and knows it, and this person moved to another team, or out of the company, two things can happen. Either if, they, if this person moves to another team, the ownership on the microservice stays with that team, someone else takes ownership, or this person takes ownership on the microservice that, that, that she wrote to the other team. If they leave the company, then you have no choice. The, the team needs to take ownership on the microservice. It's not like that code. Very, very important. So now we get to the million dollar question. What is the right size of the micros of microservice? Everybody is asking this question. I don't know why. So, there are many answers. Everybody, uh, everything, every answer that you hear is wrong. Uh, even this answer is wrong. But this is, this is what uh, we believe. Uh, the size of a microservice is the size of the team that is building it. This relates to Conway's law. If you don't know Conway, he says that the architecture that you build is, is a reflection of your organizational uh, structure. Okay? So, if you have large teams, you will get large microservices or services or monoliths. If you have small teams, you will get small microservices. How much can three people hold in their head? Uh, so we like small teams. We actually build our, our offices, our room, we designed it to hold between three to, we like teams between three to eight people uh, as a rule of thumb. Uh, some teams are larger, uh, some teams are smaller, there can be two people. But the smaller the teams, you'll get a smaller microservice. Okay, it's easier to handle, it's easier to maintain. <laughs> so, we have two monoliths. Uh, so we kind of actually got in into the microservices or the service-oriented architecture or distributed system, however you call it, it's all the same. And after that, Look, look at what things, how many things we had to learn by just having two. Okay, don't rush to 10, just have two. We have to learn about service boundary and monitoring. We have to put some monitoring infrastructure in place. Serialization, asynchronous communication with, with synchronous, with service SLAs and APIs and data separations and deployment strategies for different microservices. And how do you test those things and compatibility backward and forward? It's, it's a whole laundry list of things just because we separated this monolith into two services. And two is easier than four or ten. So if you're thinking about going this path, start small. Start with two monoliths. You will. You, it has. A, you have a lot to learn there. Okay. You have a lot to practice. 
But after you've practiced that and you think that you're ready to extract more, then we continue. And this is exactly what we did. Uh, we understand, we put all the, all the infrastructure in place to support those two. And we continue in this path. So what we actually did is, is uh, we re really, really liked the, the fact that we have a separation by SLA. Uh, so what we did is we actually divided our system or defined, this is a, a way of, of thinking, is every microservice needs, doesn't have to be, but it, it really helps if we can understand, okay, what are the concerns of, of those microservices? What is the SLA? So we actually divided our systems into two main segments, okay? The editing segment and the public segment. And we extracted more microservices according to to this segment. It helps, it helps developer think, do, do I have one microservice? Do maybe I need to separate into two? What are the concerns? Every segment has their own concerns. This is mostly write, the other one is mostly read. What, how many data centers do I need this, this microservice to support? What is the performance SLA? What is the database strategies? So different SLAs actually define our microservices strategies. Do we need one? Do we need two? Do we need one at all? Uh, and this, is, this works for us uh, pretty well. So now we got to the question is, when do we need to extract a new microservice? Or do we extract a microservice? Or is it a library? Maybe it's just a code. Maybe it's a shared library. And when you get to this question, you need to ask yourself, what do I need to do? Okay. Uh, so let's let's do an example. Okay, uh, I have a new thing that I want to make. I want to get the geolocation or the time zone from an IP address. Okay, so do I need a, a microservice for that, or maybe I can just write a library and stick it in whatever service that needs this functionality. Who thinks it's a microservice? Who thinks it's a library? So, a few guidelines. Let's analyze. What do we need to do in order to get a time zone from, from an IP address? Do we need a database of some kind of IP addresses to time zone? Yes. One, we are, we're using MaxMind. It's a service that provides this database. Does this thing has an operational overhead? Do I need to update this database? Yeah. No, things are changing. Who owns this? Once I need to update this database, do I need to go, let's say, I need this functionality in, let's say, 10 different services. Who is responsible for updating those 10 different services across the company? Is every team responsible for their own database? Or do I want one team to, to do it across the company? These are the questions that you need to ask yourself. Okay. Um, so basically, um, our guideline to, to our engineers is, if it has an operational overhead, it's a microservice. If it's just computational, if you just take code and stick it, like, so the keynote left padding, it's fine, you just include this function or this library in your code and nobody needs to maintain it. Once, once the library maintainer changes the code, your build will take it and you, you will have this thing. But once it has an operational overhead, 
Most of the time it makes sense to extract it to, to a microservice because you know you have a clear ownership, you have somebody to take care of that operationally. Okay? This is what I say, microservice is the first post DevOps architecture. Every microservice has an operational overhead. Okay? It's our job to make it, the more microservices that we have to make the operational overhead uh, less less and less. So it's easy to deploy more microservices, the more your infrastructure to support those things uh, evolve. So which stack should we use? With microservice, uh, you're free to use everything that you want. Everything on its own, they can have you know, freedom and responsibility, right? One team can choose uh, Kafka, the other can choose RabbitMQ. Uh, if you want databases, you have plenty of choices. Every team can choose can choose their own their own data store. Remember the operational overhead. Try to limit yourself to a default set of tools. Okay. Uh, not everybody is a DBA. Okay. Once we we do say freedom and responsibility, but you do have expertise. You do have, for instance, for databases, you have DBAs. They are the experts, and you probably have uh, a support teams around those different middlewares. Okay. They cannot know everything. They know. Okay. What is the standard stack? This is I have. Uh, a standard relational database, I have a standard document store, I have a standard key value store. Most people will probably get around with those. If you don't, this is the time to innovate. If the default set of tools do not fit your purpose, you do not fit the problems that you're trying to solve, this is the time to innovate. The team that actually is doing this new service and needs this new technology, takes ownership, learn about how to operate this thing, because we don't want to create an operational overhead on our ops teams. They have enough to do to support the entire company just because one team wants to do something else. So the team takes full responsibility. They learn about it. Once the next team wants to do the same, they say, hey, this one actually works. I want the next team and the next team. So once you have two or three teams that are using this new stack, then it becomes a standard stack and we tell our operations or whatever support team, hey, go learn this stuff. This is a new uh, default stack that everybody can use. But up until that point, it's, you have to justify why do you want to use something else? Not because it's cool. Because it's cool, it's not, it's not a good reason because you actually need to solve a problem that you cannot do with your standard stack. So this is about middleware. What about programming languages or, or frameworks? Microservices, you can write in whatever language that you want. You can have a mesh of anything, right? You probably know what I'm going to say, right? No, no, limit your stack, okay? This is, you, you will make a big mistake if you let any team choose any language that they want. You have a lot of cross-cutting concerns when you're working in a distributed system in a mesh, okay? You have session validations and security issues and auditing and testing. You don't want that every team will choose their own logging system or their own logging format or parse your, your, your user session differently or, or have three different implementation on how you, you, you encode things or how you extract things. If you have a bug, you need to wait for the whole company to fix this stack, okay? If you limit your stack to one, two, three, again, as, as a standard, not everything can be limited, but as a standard that, uh, that you default to those main languages, 
if you think about your, your development velocity, you need to fix bugs only once. Okay, you have this framework that everybody share, everybody know the same stack, you can move teams, people between teams, they don't need to learn new, new languages and new stacks. It really, really helps in, in maintaining developer, uh, development velocity. If you haven't heard about uh, Uber's experience, when they didn't do that, go listen to their uh, chief architect. Um, again, if you don't have the right tool to the task, yes, by all means, go and do something else. Okay, we at Wix, uh, our backend is mostly default to Scala. Uh, we just like last year we added Node.js as a default stack, but that was done after a really really uh, uh, huge. Uh, thinking effort and it, does it really uh, help us in adding another stack because we need to build all those tools and frameworks that we already have in, on the JVM with Node, but we decided, yeah, it's, it's worthwhile to do. And we actually do have other things, but they are not default, they're not standard, and, and we actually we know exactly what those are. So we have in Go, we have some in, in Python, we have, we have many different microservices in different languages, but they're really, really contained. Um, but a new thing goes to a def default to, an, to the standard stack. So remember, keep it simple. You need to reduce the cost of a new microservice. You can evolve, you always evolve your system because your system will grow and you will need more things or you will need to change things. Okay? Think about the, the evolution of the system. You got to microservices because of evolution, because your monolith couldn't scale. So it's evolutionary thing, so you need to understand how you're gonna evolve across time without having too much overhead. So, those are just some of the things that, that you will learn about microservices. You also need, need to learn about how to do distributed transactions, uh, how to do system monitoring, distributed tracings, uh, what are the trade-offs, like we said, between uh, microservices or extending an existing one, making it bigger, it's fine. Uh, deployment strategies versus dependencies. How do I, I have a change of, of microservices that perform one function? How do I need to deploy one and, and forward backward compatibility? Uh, split the teams if the teams become too large. Microservices really helps you. Right? Split the team. This team takes ownership on those microservices. The other the other half of the team takes ownership on different set of, of microservices and they can grow independently and split them again and again the more they, they grow. So, summary. Every microservice has an operational overhead. Remember, it's very, very important. And it's all, basically it's all about trade-offs, okay? Don't do what you don't need right now. Remember this overhead. When you have a problem, use so use the tool to solve the problem. Don't put new tools just because they're there, or just because I tell you so, or just because someone else tells you so, hey, this is the new cool thing. If it solves the problem, use the tool, but don't use it too soon. Okay, and monoliths are great. You can have five monoliths, it's like microservices, it's fine, if it's doing the job, it's easier. It's easier on testing, it's, it's faster time to market, okay? Uh, microservices solve different set of problems. You have a scaling issues. Uh, uh, you want more team autonomy. You can choose, and you can mix and match. And remember, microservices will not solve everything. Okay? If you think about monolith, it's a big pile of the microservices, just smaller parts. All right? <laughs> you can tweet that. All right, thank you very much.
Uh, all right, we questions. got a bunch of interested que interesting questions, uh, but because it's just about lunch time, maybe we can try to at least the most interesting one to answer. Right. So the question is, because you are testing on production, uh, what did you do if some tests failed, and how do you organize your week's process to fix issues on production as soon as possible without downtime? Uh, okay, so if we find an issue on production, uh, first of all, we're doing continuous delivery. And when you put a new code on production, it's mostly closed with feature toggles or feature flags. And when we do the tests, we th our customers don't get the new code. But the test does open the feature flag for that feature and test that feature on production, but only the test or the QA uh, are exposed to that. So our, our customers are not affected. If we do find a bug on production, then we just either roll back it's easier just doing a, a, a deployment. But usually the automation doesn't find those, those bugs that, that we need to roll back. Uh, if it's, like I say, if it's closed with, with a feature flag, we can just fix it because it's not rolled out to the customers. Uh, if it's something that is live, uh, usually our, we're the, the scale that our customers or our monitoring system actually catch that before our, our users. Uh, but uh, it really depends on does it have a business effect or not? If it doesn't have a business effect or, or, or on our customers, not on, on, not on Wix, then we will fix it. If it does affect our users, then we will, first thing we will try is to roll back. Make sense? Okay, thanks again. So um, that would be it. Um, if you if you feel like guys, f feel free to reach out to him and ask the questions. And uh, but because we are like ten minutes into lunch time, let's go and have a lunch.